hardware, databases, and software, both licensed and developed in-house, to maximize the quality of services delivered to the ArtStore user community. Prior to joining ArtStore in 2002, he was the CTO and CIO, so that's the Chief Technical Officer and Chief Information <laughs> Officer, of Phantom Knowledge. It's a very interesting project, Inc., from 2000 to 2002. Established by Columbia University in alliance with 13 partners, Phantom had offered lifelong learning and professional development online. Before joining Phantom, he was Vice President of Information Systems at Uproar, Inc., and earlier he held a range of positions in information technology with Chase Manhattan, the New York Blood Bank, where he developed the first barcode blood processing information system, which created a standard for the healthcare industry. He is also an adjunct faculty member at Columbia University School of Continuing Education in the Computer Technology Program. He received his Doctorate of Engineering Science and Master of Science from Columbia University and his Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Engineering and Computer Science from Cornell University. So aside from being very well equipped to give us an overview, you also met a criteria that our little group had and they said, don't bring in a librarian because this <laughs> is just about libraries. This is a, a interesting set of issues that in order to resolve it really does require partnership between a lot of different uh, expertise. So thank you very much for coming back. Oh. oh, thank you for inviting me. This is exciting to share with you some of our experience for the last couple of years on digitization. Do I have to talk into the mic? No. Wait, the test? I think we're, I think we're okay. Okay, I'll try to speak louder. Oh, this is the end. So I'm going to go to the beginning. Sorry, it's not over yet. It's not over. Okay. So today I'm going to share with you some of our experience in the digital landscape and content strategy at higher education. Where Asto has been working with many higher education institutions. Uh, so first, I want to share with you some of the things we heard from our partner in different university. So this is a different different quote from a librarian. A professor walked into her room and said, Hey, look at this beautiful uh, images data I have in my laptop. I got a grant from Provost a couple of years ago. A grad student did for me. You see, everything is in there. But the graduate student is gone. And I don't know the password for the file maker pro anymore. I need the images next week. What should I do? Please get it for me. I guess the story is different here. We have the professor need tomorrow, right? <laughs> so this is typical. Or a librarian from a major library say, well, we want to share our images with everybody, but the lawyer said, did you check the grandchild, great-grandchild of the photographer who took the painting? Or do you know who painted it? Who are the creator? Did you talk to the estate? If you can clear all the rights, sure, share with everybody. See, nobody can track down every single descendant of the photographer. You have to lock it down. That's when we can't share with anybody. So this is another story from the legal viewpoint. Or oh, another librarian come tell us that we try all kind of system. We build our own, and then we know we have an art department with an architect department. They have a hundred yards away, but they use two different systems. So an art historian cannot go to an architect department and say, hey, can I use some of the images, or vice versa. And there are the other departments over the campus. Or another Art history chairman, now no longer librarian, now go back to some <laughs> faculty. The chairman of the department said, Oh boy, we have to learn to do everything. We manage our own images. Maybe to some people love technology, but our job is to teach art history. Why do we have to learn Photoshop? Why do we have to learn Biomaker Pro? Why do we have to learn all these things? And then some professor do something on their own and then go on sabbatical. Now nobody else can get those same content to teach and learn. So what we, when we talk to a lot of our friends in the different higher education, we all come to a similar conclusion. An institution management of digital content would be a solution to solve some of those problems. Why? Because then all professors have their own content, but it's never enough. No, there's no one single faculty say, I have everything I need to teach. There's always other things they need. And it could from different sources, could be from their own photography, copy stand, from vendor, from friends, or from institution collection. So what I want to talk today is that how an institution-wide approach may make sense, but again, it's not easy. The bottom line is that nothing is easy, as we all find out, but there is an easier way to solve the problem. 
So first, what's the myth? The myth is that digitization is easy. Digitization is cheap and it's archival. Easy, right? Just scan something in the computer, just type a few words, and they'll be in your C drive forever, right? <laughs> no, it'll disappear. So the advantage of a cross-institution digital assessment system has a many, many advantages. Some of them is cross-curriculum. It's no longer just the architecture department using for architecture. It could share the art department or history department, English department. And a good digital asset management allows you to use it for any software, not only the FileMaker Pro on your laptop. It will be available to any software that any discipline want to use. And the third bullet point is very interesting. It's what we call right management. As I mentioned a typical example earlier, it could be extreme case where they are loyal to lock down everything. On the other hand, you don't want to just share everything with everybody. But different things you have different rights. Something is your own, something is the institution, something is public available. And the fourth is very important, long-term dependability. We have seen so many cases. We have uh, worked with Arsenal, as we'll explain to you later. We have big image database. We've been working with museum to agreement for, with them to get the content to share with the higher education. We, we have an agreement with a museum around here, I won't name who. And then they say, sure, come, I will share your, our content images with you. Then I say, where are your images? They say, we don't know. So we send the people there, look up the DVD, look up the hard drive, look up everywhere. It's not easy to keep content for prosperity. And that's why the long-term dependability is so important. Because you need it for a long, long time. And of course, the next bullet point, uh, what redundancy? Why should we scan, everybody scan Mona Lisa again? Remember a couple years ago when Codex stopped selling slide projector? Every single school said, now to scan my Mona Lisa slide because nobody can use those slides anymore. It doesn't make sense. Certain thing is special, certain thing is highly redundant. And of course, the last is the most important time. We want to help the faculty, right? We want them to teach and learn, not learn how to use Photoshop or copying the file from one drive to another drive. So what is the problem we talk about already? Faculty should be able to do real learning, not to learn about method standard or decide whether should I use Picasso or iPhoto. So an ideal solution is something that's available anywhere, 24 by 7. From classroom, off campus, in campus, office, easily discoverable. That's when you can find it. Uh, and it's through a web-based system that's supported by the library. This web is still the best. Except, unfortunately, we're slightly moved for so those in technology. We're slowly moving back into application, all this app on your iPhone, iPad. So we swing from custom application all the way to web-based. Now we're slowly swinging back to because all this bring your own device. Everybody bring their own device. So now we swing a little bit back to custom application, which can give you very good experience, but it's not a cross-platform. So that creates another challenge to us. Okay? And of course, it has to be integrated with all kinds of presentation teaching system. And the next one is interesting. So the resolution is high enough because we're doing scholar research. So the digital content has to be not a little thumbnail that we can just show. It has to be high enough resolution that research could be done in deeper uh, research effort. And it has to be authentic enough from the original artwork or original uh, scientific uh, representation. And the, it has to be the critical mass is big enough that you can reuse it. So if only uh, 1% of the stuff you can find it through this central system, 99% of the find yourself, that's not too useful also. So this is an ideal solution, as we can say, ideal solution, that's been, it's very hard. But it's nice to start with an ideal, so we can see how far we are, where we are, how soon we can get to it, and how far. And this is the smiling faces, we want to see, we want to see all the faculty smiling, students smiling, staff smiling, <laughs> even the public smiling. Right? Because we offer not only we are not serving only the institution, something we want to share with the whole public too. A school has certain responsibility. In the meantime, there's so many tools, cost management system, web log, citation manager, there are so many tools that all these smiling faces using. And the bottom is all these repository available from 
publisher that the school may purchase, the digital library, learning object that's created by the scholar themselves, and institutional created content. So there are all these three layers. And how do we keep them all happy? That is the holy grail or the ideal solution we talk about. So now let me talk about one example that solves some of the problem. I'm not here to do a sales job because you have been asked already. So you can, don't worry, this is not a sales job. They just explain to you how our store, as a digital library, try to solve some of those problems. Again, we cannot solve all. So a quick summary, our store was founded through the Andrew Mellon Foundation, but now it's an independent organization with more than 1.4 million images uh, in the database. High resolution, we work with more than 200 museums, get the original, extremely high quality images, and we catalog all the metadata. And it's a password protected database, so we honor the right of the contributor. So it's really a repository of aggregated collection. So the collection comes from hundreds of museums, archives, and estate. And so we have beautiful uh, photographs of architectures, there are even people who love library <laughs> a long time ago, even now. And we have uh, contemporary art uh, from this is from Maltis, even I know a little bit about art. And because of this fast, fast federated search, if you search for Cezanne, you not only find Cezanne in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, you find Cezanne across all the museums that is part of the art store community. So instead of going to one museum, you can virtually see all kinds of painting <coughs> from the same creator from many different museums. And we have a contemporary art. Uh, and if art store is not only art, we even have 80,000 photographs well event from the Magnum photo. So it's great for uh, history study, maybe even English study. So there are all kinds of content available. So it's really a network trying to help the education and scholarly user. So far, we have 1,400 subscriber institution. So it's a growing community of users that are using this vast digital resource. So how, so how do people use a digital library like Astor? So I want to share with you an example of how Astor is being used for research and teaching. So as I mentioned earlier, we have high quality content. So images of extremely high quality come from the museum quality. So this is an image of supposed to be a son of Rubens. And then we have the content. You can go back to the original source and you can zoom all the way in. Uh, all the way to the, if you have a moment, you can zoom all the way in the smile to see is the smile really a smile. And you can look at the brush stroke. So this is good for research, not only for a little paper. You can do really deep research. Uh, but some of you may say, I have Google, why do I need you, right? Google solved my problem already. So uh, let me give you an example. Let's say you're a scholar trying to do some research on Hercules. So if you go to a library like Astor, you'll find all these different old Greek painting on artwork related to Hercules, right? Now, what if you go to ask, uh, Google, what do you see? <laughs> now, some, may you, some of you may think this is better than Astor, but a lot of people will say, wow, if I go to Google, I, well, we do have different kind of Hercules here. If you're a Disney fan, you may find the Disney movie right there. So I'm trying to contrast a, a curated digital library versus the Wild Wild West, which is Google out there. And in our case, we even allow users to do something onto the content. So a scholar can add additional information to an image that they think, because scholarly that's for, for arguing or debate. So art, as I find out, is not a perfect science. Sometimes you don't know who painted it, when it was painted, so it's good for uh, sharing content between scholars. And we allow users to create image group. That means they can group content together. So that's creating knowledge, and they can describe the image group, and you want to share it across institutions. So this is another, not only we build content, we allow the user to build content and share the content first within the institution and eventually across institution. So for example, you can describe a image group, a group of image slides you put together. And then we also create some content ourselves. So based on raw content from the museum, from the uh, slide library, we put together topic that we feel interested. 
could be as simple as uh, medieval art or Islamic art. So we put content together. So these are the list of content we asked or put together. We have music history, Middle East, Eastern study, medieval study, etc., etc. So more like starter kit to help our user to learn. At the same time, we also started another interesting idea two years ago. We start giving a travel award. We want to promote our users to share the content. We say, okay, tell us what you've been using us for teaching and learning. We pick the first five top uh, winner and we give them a grant for traveling. I think a thousand five hundred dollar. So it's amazing what come back. We have people using our store to start working on a book. And then with users who look at proportion perspective, I never know there's mathematics inside art. So there's this professor to find out all this image related proportion and perspective. Another scholar used music iconography. I didn't know there's so many images, painting, artwork in art store that can represent uh, music iconography. And then someone worked on about the race, sugar, and about the history of the United States plus the final one is something through disability. There's a lot of painting related to people that disabled through Christian. It's amazing that people can use Astor for all kinds of scholarly research. So we promote that. And at the same time, we're using some concept like uh, Amazon. When you go to Amazon, you uh, buy a book. Amazon will say, I recommend you to buy other books too, right? So we do something similar in Astor because we have 100,000 users over many years. We know who like to use what images together. So we use the same, what we call item to item collaborative routing approach, which is the standard way Amazon uses to group all the books people buy. We do the same thing in our store. So now, when you look, let's say you search for Benin, you'll see all these different images, uh, masks from Berlin, and you'll see a little symbol there. When you click on it, you'll find all the other images other people have used together with this uh, face mask also. So it may promote you, say, hey, why other people use this? Or why? And the long tail somewhere is as interesting as the beginning, as we know. Some people, why they want to contrast deliberately two different images. So hopefully this will help promote uh, deeper research and thinking. And we even use knowledge from Google. We borrow Google spell check so that we can do as good a job as Google in spell check. If you misspell something in our store, we send the word to Google, and Google will come and say, do you mean this? And I say, yes. So we are as good as Google. Ooh. At least that part. And I'm not lying, because I actually use Google's API. And of course, we have to move our store to iPhone, iTouch, iPad. I mean, we have to create our application available. And actually, on the iPhone and iPad, we add a new feature. Uh, that we don't have on the regular website, you can randomize it. Let's say your professor asks you to study a image group for a quiz. You can, like a flashboard on your iPad or iPhone, you can rotate the image and look at the metadata and then flip it again or randomize all the images in the group so you can test yourself. So this was a pretty cool idea. And so we're finding out different devices have different advantages and have different technology that allow you to do different things. And so back to our store, uh, another thing we learned is that we were naive. I'll tell you all my problems. Just don't repeat it to my boss. So when we started seven, eight years ago, we think if we can get all the museum images, get all the library slides, we should be enough image for everybody, right? Wrong. There's so much images out there, and there's all this special collection that nobody knows about except one party institution. So we started having content from 200, slowly grew up to 200 museums with more than 1.4 million, but that's not enough if every institution has their own collection that is special to them. And every scholar professor on sabbatical will run around with digital camera. When they come back, they have hundreds of thousands of images that nobody ever seen. A special angle of the Taj Mahal, a special angle of this and that that nobody else has, and they would love to use to teach. So how do you mix them together? You can't just say, no, you must only use this. So we implement a system to allow institution partner to give us the content so we can load them into our store and we allow individual professor to upload the images almost like a flicker for higher education. So, and the problem we find out is that 
every school and university use different system to build the digital content. Look at this, we did a little survey. The people is content DM and Bob, Iris, Library OPEC, Luna, MD, Excel, Discovery. It's unbelievable. What is more scary? Sometimes the same school have all this. This is not a pie chart for different school. Sometimes typical university with all this from different departments. So when they give us content, it's very hard to load into our store. So I just want to show you how our repository grow for the year. A picture tells a thousand words. So look at this. So the blue is our store. We've been growing slowly but steadily. But the explosion is the hosted Eastern collection because every partner who joined our store said, I have content, very good content that my professor use all the time that I want to be inside our store so we can use the same software to teach and learn. So I say, okay, as again, I was nice. Said, okay, give it to me. I'll load it in. Oh, that was the worst thing I ever promised. As I mentioned, there are different systems out there, different images, and when you load image and data and try to match them, what happened? They never match. You'll find half the image of no data, half the data of no images. It was unbelievable, but we promised the user. So we say twice a year, give us your data, but I hope my group will shove it into our store. But it's not scalable. And, and even on the personal side, we did not build a good software platform per for professor to upload images. It was an afterthought. It, but even that, over the year, with half a million images uploaded by all these scholar professors, because they really enjoy using one place to get all the content together. It's the same software for teaching and learning. So this is the problem we're seeing. And it's not scalable because we are a curator of museum that grows slowly. But this part is from our partner. And they were all complaining. They say, I don't want to give you your content twice a year. I have new content next week. The professor wants to teach it next month. What should we do? So we're in a dilemma. How do we help our user <coughs> use the content in a simple platform? So we come up with a new idea called <coughs> Shared Shelf. So we say, why don't we try to build a digital access management system <coughs> that our user can do it themselves and push the content into the R store delivery platform. So professor scholar can use the same content using the same software and you can export to PowerPoint also. So our software is very simple to use. You can aggregate content together, pick what you want. You can show them online for uh, zooming and panning or you can produce a PowerPoint. So we, so as we mentioned, we started the hosting pilot and then it just become too much to handle. Everybody wants to put it in and everybody give a different format. So we decided to start this share shell project. And we work with eight partners because we find out we need to know what the user want. We don't want to build something on our own. The only way to find is to talk to the community. So we talk to the big university, uh, Harvard, Yale, and some of the big uh, public universities, U of Miami, U of Illinois, and some small liberal art colleges. So we have a range of partners to work together to design what is the new digital SMA system that they want. So we come up with a four-phase, four-component system. We have a basic cataloging system that allows the user to catalog their content. Because if you don't catalog it correctly, can you find it? No. We find that there's no free lunch. It's not easy to search an image. You can content base it never work, not yet. Uh, so we need to have plus when T put content into the digital item. And we need a vocabulary warehouse to normalize the data. Uh, one thing we find now is it's so hard. Everybody calls something differently. Even the creator. You may call Leonardo Da Vinci, Da Vinci Leonardo. Remember the folk uh, Da Vinci code? <laughs> Actually, a lot of scholars say it's the wrong title. Because Da Vinci's name is not Leonardo. Da Vinci is the place that he lived. It should be called Leonardo Code. It will be more accurate. I mean, I leave it up to the scholar to argue. So you can imagine, we don't even know how to call a painter. So if there's a vocabulary, you can normalize all your names. Then you can find things more easily. One of the embarrassing things I have to share with you is that with 1.5 million images in our store, I cannot answer a simple question like this. If you ask me, how many unique artwork were been asked of from Da Vinci? Just imagine that little question. Should be easy to answer, right? 
Now you have to normalize all the other from every museum, make sure they all point to Leonardo da Vinci. And within that, I may have Mona Lisa 25 times from, from some library slide, from the Louvre Museum, from another archive. So it's amazing to answer a simple question like that involves a lot of work using a vocabulary warehouse. They can link all your content to the correct creator, link all the content to the same work of art. Then I can answer that question. But once I can answer that question, then you as a user will not have to figure out what are you looking for. So having a vocabulary warehouse is very useful. And it's based on discipline. Art has its own science. I was assuming that the taxonomy for biology is cast in stone. I was shocked to find out, no, every bird still adding different taxonomy. The only thing we are sure is Homo sapiens. Nothing else is sure. And so, but it's nice to have a vocab taxonomy. Then you can match everything together. And of course, the key part is we need a digital asset management. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about digital asset. Everything has helped us to find a digital asset. And after that, this cannot be the best kept secret, only you know about it. We want to be able to publish the content to anywhere. Could be to our store as a digital library platform, could be your own website, could be a publicly available website. What us, we are also providing a publicly available equivalent our store. Or you can publish to Flickr, or that's the whole point, or Omega, you may build your own Drupal website. So the dream is that this system is not locked in. It's not one of those in a laptop in a professor that can go anywhere. You can push a button and go anywhere you want and decide how much you want to share. So we have a cataloging system, very flexible, that you can create your template so it doesn't have to be related to art, it could be related to history, astronomy. We're working with some astronomy uh, professor and biology professor. And we start creating, share vocabulary, start with the major one related to art and humanity from Getty, but we're also extending our system that can work with any other vocabulary that's available on the web. <coughs> and because having vocabulary allows you to group all content related to the same creator together and all made from the same work of art. So make it much easier for the user to find things. They don't have to go around and say, hey, are this the same picture or same uh, image of the same bridge or different bridge? And managing digital asset is not easy. So this is a key requirement for a system like Shell that we can handle images or QTV, audio and video is coming down. As we all know, everybody wants to be a multimedia, not a single media. And persistent is the key word too. It has to be there. I mean, I, I, I keep talking to all these scientists. They got a grant from MIH doing work. They spend half the time putting, taking images from microscope and the only thing they remember is the name of the file. <laughs> That's the only metadata, the name of the file. So a year later, how do you find it? Hmm, <laughs> let me look at every single image, try to see which one. They spend half, it's unbelievable. A researcher spending half of the time trying to label all the microscope slides that were stored in a C drive that was never backed up by anybody, anywhere. Oh. And so having a somewhere, a system that can persistently store this source file is very important. And it has to be cloud-based. You can't say you have to store on your local system. We cannot help you. It has to be cloud-based, but you can easily get it, upload or download it. And there are all kinds of embedded metadata that come with the digital content nowadays. So we must be able to extract it. When you take a picture of all these new fancy digital cameras, there are all kinds of information in it. If you have a GPS, we actually know where you take it and the date and time. So all those information should be extracted automatically from the digital content. There may be header in the video file, maybe time sequence. All those are lost if you don't take them. And once you migrate them. And then that's the key part, allow you to publish your content to any system, to our store as a digital library, so that you can share within your institution. Finally, architecture can share with art. I can share with humanity. Or if you want to, and if you get your law approval, you can share across different institutions. Uh, could be across all uh, public, anybody in the world with smaller resolution. And we allow content to be exported out to Google Images or Flickr or your local delivery system. At the same time, it must have what we call some open API. So other system could be a learning management system, could go into this repository and pull out content for teaching and learning. 
So if we can achieve all this goal, will be useful. The whole point of building a system to make it useful. So uh, share shell is an approach to try to solve some of those problems, if not all. And so the holy grail, the dream, with a digital SMA system, you can catalog it, then share more carefully, you can publish to Google, you can publish to Flickr, if you get all the lawyers to say yes, or you can publish your own institute repository, or go to Astor, share with other Astor content, or a public shareable comment which Astor is providing free of charge for any institution want to share the content with the whole world. Because remember I mentioned Astor is a password protected only subscriber can go in. But we also have a similar version on the public web that any institution can publish the content to make it shareable. So again, this allows you to have control, freedom. You can decide only your institution and see it or only you can see it. Some researcher told me they don't even want the boss to see the images until it's published. So I said, okay, fine, we will give you uh, a feature that only you can see, nobody else can see it until it's ready. So we have extreme case from personal personal to institution or just a professor, to student or cross <coughs> institution across everybody, part of our store community or the open web. So any system must be able to do that. You should be able to decide who can see and what and how. And we have a lot of, in addition to a partner, we have a lot of institutes signing up on this beta series. And you can see Drexel is here. Hey, Drexel is one of our partner too. So all the things we talk about, you can try out too, uh, if you want to. And we're very excited with this idea because we really want to help our user to share their digital content. And we're moving slowly. We can't promise we solve all the problems we're learning together. We need all your feedback to see how we can grow together. And this is an exciting project. We see enormous growth to help the research and education community to use digital content. That's part of our mission. And that's why we're here to share with you and learn from you and work together. You can help me, I can help you, and together hopefully make this ideal system work perfectly. <laughs> so I think, and there are other uh, institutions and as I mentioned, we're also pushing art into the non-art world. I mean, we're, my boss said once, the only mistake he made is calling art store, art store. We're not for art only. <laughs> we are actually start image store into a multimedia store. And so we can handle anything. But the name is very important. <laughs> People get stuck with a name. And so that's why we try to push into the non-art community. We're working with uh, some universities on a bio diversity database using Darwin Core and Audubon Core, which is for the birds, the Audubon Core and Darwin Core in general. And then we're working some astronomy collection based on AVM and astronomy metadata standard. So we're trying to push out to different metadata standard and handle different kind of content. And we're working with medical school, uh, marine library and natural history museum to push into try to see how we can expand the Astor range of services and product into different disciplines. And so far, it's been quite successful. That's why I'm learning all these things. There's no standard in standard. And there's a good enough standard and not good enough standard. So again, we want to keep moving on, not only images, we'll handle video, we can handle manipulating of uh, images, and we have started some, some 3D uh, images we can rotate, if I have time, I can demonstrate later on in Astro with some 3D images, we take 36 images of a statue, you can rotate them around, we sort of QTV out to simply walk through of the caves, etc. And we work with everybody, try to find out what is the next things that our user community want, and we try to listen and improve. Uh, so, I think I... Finish. Okay, sorry. I had to rush a little bit. And we're open to continue a conversation. Yeah. Uh, just want us uh, open for questions or comments or discussion. Yes. I want to ask uh, what portion of your collection is already accessible for public? 
Uh, we don't. Uh, yes, when, when we sign up agreement with the contributor, especially museum, we, we agree to protect the content to make it available to only a small community for teaching and learning. Because for some of you know, don't quote me, we are relying on the fair use law. Fair use only for learning, non-profit learning, education. Once you put it outside the public, then we don't know how people use it. But we're slowly expanding it. As remember, Steve Jobs wrote a big article in New York Times. Steve Jobs is not stopping users from listening to the song. It's the record industry. We are similar. It's the content provider because we are the middle guy. We don't have content. Us have no content. The content comes from the museum, comes from the uh, uh, archive. So up to them to tell us. If they tell us yes, it can release to the public, we're more than happy to. So we're just the enabler, the middle guy. But for institutions, it's different because any of our share shop partners, they own the content. So if they want to make it public, we let them, we have a separate website called Share Sale Commons. It's publicly available. They can push the content. So a few universities already, Cornell, uh, University of Delaware, they have some grant funded project that when they digitize, the mandate was to make it available to anybody, not only within the institution. So with a parallel website similar to our store with limited functionality that allow our users to publish those content over there, that is open to the public. So we need approval. It's not that we stop it. We, we are the innocent guy. <laughs> because I, I noticed that there's a difference between the US institutions and European institutions. Oh. Right now, even European projects or the projects in the European Union, the idea is that these memory institutions should, should public, uh, publish everything in a way that public yeah. can benefit. But so that's the, the main idea. I, to, I can talk to forever Europeans. The problem with Europeans is that aggregate anything. People cannot find anything. Once you find something, you go back to the original site. The aggregation is still need plus rent here. It's my personal opinion. You can't just open a site and throw anything in there. So Europe is a very good example. It allows any museum in Europe to throw anything in there. Now, anybody go there trying to find things. Once they find it, they click, they go back to the original museum website. Completely different software, different look and feel, different everything. So, Europea was a very good idea. But if you ask any scholar, go home and ask any scholar, it's not usable. Because it's a random, it's like Google. It's no different than Google. You can find anything you want, but how do you use it? Do I clear the right? Uh, some of them say you can't use it. Even worse, you find it in Europea. When you go to the museum, say, sorry, you can't use it. You have to call somebody to find it. So you can create more problems. You want to go someplace, you know you can use it, right? You don't want to find something, they go back and say, hey, haha, I got you. You find me, but you cannot use it. So we have to be very careful. These people expectation when they see something, they think they can use it. When they find it, they cannot use it. Even more embarrassing. That's my personal opinion. I think there's two notions. They, they believe in integrated access, but here we believe in integrated content. Yes, exactly. So there are two notions, but I think the, the amount of public data is yeah. more there. Yeah. Enormous. It's it, 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 slightly better than Google. I totally agree, because any museum contribute. But uh, it's so diverse. For a scholar, it's very hard to use the content, because you don't know what you can get. You find it. Can I use it in my PowerPoint? The whole point at the end of the day, right? We want a scholar, we want to find content we can use to share, to teach, and learn. If you still do a lot more research to find out, there's a lot of work for the scholar, right? I mean, the scholar still have to click and say, oh, can I use it, can I use it? Who is going to do that? <laughs> Our job is to teach and learn. So it's a very good point. I agree, it's a very good model. So, Bill, in, in your work with various other universities, um, are there some insights of how? Uh, what, what are the successful approaches to trying to manage this or facilitate this on a campus level? Because as we were talking earlier, we're, we're at the beginning stage of that. And so what can we benefit from other people's mistakes and, and learning curves in terms of how to, uh, not necessarily as you're saying, building just a big aggregate, but what, what are the areas where we should really first concentrate on trying to help organize our own assets. Yeah, most of them try to pick one or two projects to prove, prove success. I mean, success lead to success. Mm -hmm. So everybody trying to pick one or two projects. Uh, their current is being hosted in some system that's hard to maintain. There's everybody has some system somewhere <laughs> that's very hard to maintain, and they want to share across the same institution. 
not a cost institution. Uh, and so uh, we all sit down with them and say, let's pick one or two projects that's really useful, that you want to encourage teaching and learning. Because the key thing, and we can supplement what we have been asked for, and with your content, so make it easier for the user to teach and learning. So we find the first one or two projects so important. Once they find it successful, wow, then everybody say, hey, can I put my content in there? And the hardest part is migration. The hardest part, because as you see my rainbow chart, everybody have different system. And how do you migrate them? That's the biggest challenge. Even us, we, we don't have simple answer. We have standard. If you can export your content in a standard way, we can ingest it. But nobody knows how to. They have a FileMaker Pro, they have a 4D database, they have something in SQL database. So that's the biggest challenge, is to, from scratch, it's so easy. You go in there, build a new collection, start entering, but everybody has some legacy somewhere that they want to put in as soon as possible, because I need to teach it. And like the, the, the toy industry has the Christmas crunch, right? We have the September crunch. Because everybody wants to put the content in there, so when school starts, they can use it. So wow, every summer we go crazy, because everybody wants to say, hey, I must have this collection in there. So we should plan around a semester if we want to do teaching and learning. And if you were to take off your art store hat right. and think broadly, because certainly um, art store has, has made an a, a important dent into organizing this, but are there institutions that are using art store, let's say, but other platforms as well? And I know some earlier work at, at Yale, for example, were trying to do these crossover mappings, and like, it, is, is is that inherently still a structure and an approach that makes sense? It, it depends on institution. And what is we, it? we have some, some really small ones that say, oh, thank you, I throw away everything, like some community colleges. I mean, they don't even want to know about anything else. And with the extreme high and like the Harvard and Yale, which they still have their own infrastructure. So we have to live in, that's why interoperability, oh, I, for me, the word interoperability is the key thing. There's a, one of our slides that we have a set of API that we are a repository. If you have your own teaching and learning system, you can come to us to get the content to use it. So one thing we promise the whole world is that everybody was met at the old system because they log in. They come I will say, from day one, we are open system. All the content is open standard. All the images, you can push a button, get all your content out. And so for us, Making it open is fundamental. Otherwise, nobody want, they don't want to have another locking system. They have too many locking system already. So with a whole set of standard API, you can get content anytime, real time, uh, harvesting every night or once a year, we dump it out for you. Or you can access your control vocabulary. Or on the other side, our Keton system can go to your control vocabulary. Let's say you have your own taxonomy, have a whole set of database use taxonomy. We don't have to build it again inside the new system. So we want to make sure we're part of the overall infrastructure of any organization. We could be the only thing in town if you're a tiny, small community colleges who want to get involved, or we could be a one small piece. We even work as a, for half of their own digital SMN system. So we're just a catalog system. We use the digital SMN system, so we're so modular that we can actually, you can just get one part of the whole component of the whole part. Yes? Um, you had, uh Two slides ago, you had this like nested series of rectangles. Yes, yes. Level of permission. So you had within an institution, like right. between our store and yes. shared. Yes. The percentage of the assets fall into each of those. Ah, okay. Right now, uh, our store, we have around 1.5 million. Mm. As I mentioned, we have around 4 million hosted collection from 104. Out of the 1,400 institutions who subscribe to Astor, around 100 have hosted collection in Astor. So we have around 4 million images. And then from the individual scholar who uploads is around 500,000. So to all together, around 6 million. But we see once we have share shell up and running, we see the institution collection grow exponentially. It's right now it's so painful. They have to send all the invention data to us, we have to match them, load them in there, and say, oh, we don't find this, we don't find that. Once they can do it, we see this grow into the 20, 30, 40 million, very easy in the next two years. So this is going to be a big archive of shareable content. Because we allow you to decide where you want to go. I mean, we upfront we know that's the most important, but something, everything should be free, fine. 
put it up there. <laughs> now they say, no, only I can see, even my boss cannot see it. Oh, oh this is a touch screen. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you touch back? I can touch forward, how do I touch back? <laughs> so, yes, so, so that's, uh, that's the key. When we build this system, we want to promise our customer we're not going to lock you in, that, that is open. You can get the content, you can use as small component as possible, as big a component as possible. We could fit right into you, and we can help you. You can harvest our content, we'll fit into your institution-wide federated search. We, we have seen everyone, Acrobouser, which is our partner, we've seen it all. Uh, World Cup lo Local, we can export our, our metadata into World Cup uh, Cut Local, so you can search it across institution. Uh, so that is our plan to try to fit in. As your friend. Sure. I'd say if you did best to learn, just like the comment about where we are, and we've just started being this. We're, we're not trying to promote that our stress is going to be the only answer. I mean, we, we went into the experimentation. Yeah. I, I thought I saw best really. Okay. Um, ah, yeah, we actually uploaded our first images to Shared Shelf about three hours ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we're on the beta. We had an uploading issue. Um, and they're actually images from the Drexel Nanotechnology Institute. Ooh. So it'll be fun to play with. We have an appalling lack of metadata right now, but we're going to get them over here. So we're, we're beginning, and it's interesting, we thought we were going to begin this with images from um, architecture and interiors, but they don't have things digitized yet. So we are beginning, we were offered this set of images from Nanotech, so that's wow. what I'm starting You'll be able to see those upstairs in a few minutes? I hope so. Yep. <laughs> Maybe we can have one more question, and then I, I just because I know several of our, our partners here are meaning to set up, and Bill will be continuing to stay with us. We've now continued our informal conversation over we're talking to somebody around 11, we'll start to show this. I, I have two quick uh, questions for you. So have you had any issues integrating it without any LMSs? I mean, we have Blackboard, have you? Well, it, it's Blackboard doesn't want to do with us. <laughs> it's the other way around. Oh, Blackboard, okay. in general, there are a lot of, we, it's, there's five ways to integrate with any learning system. I mean, anything you do in R Store, you can create an image group of 50 images. Click a button, create a PowerPoint. Then you can upload to Blackboard. That's what 90% professors do. Right, they just right. upload them. So we can do that easily. We, it's not easy to get that part. In the beginning, our content provider won't even let us uh, download big images. We convince them. So now we can download 1,000 pixels, which is good enough for PowerPoint. They can zoom in and save the zoom in. So now the first is easy, is that the scholar professor can create a slideshow or image group, click a button, create PowerPoint, and upload to Blackboard. The first one. Secondly, every image group of images automatically create a, a persistent URL. So you can paste that URL inside Blackboard, and then the student can click there and then launch it. And then do uh, whatever they want with the image group study. Or you can actually have a link in Blackboard and say, go to Astor. <laughs> <laughs> and what about video, the video portion? You're saying you're going to eventually we, do we, that? We, that's my boss keep telling me, Bill, make sure you do image good first. And uh, so we, okay. we want, we, everybody asks us, we have to be very careful. Video, the problem is the bandwidth is enormous yeah. trying to upload. Yeah. We're not talking about YouTube where you upload a three second jumping up and down and a kid in a trampoline. With top of scholarly, you could upload a five hours video and and it's not that it's impossible. There are kind of practical and technical uh, implementation. And how much we, we did look at that actually. We there is a open source system of Kaltura. Some of you may have heard of. So we think about hiding Kaltura and behind Shesha, so we can make it available because we are cataloging. We may not want to be in the video hosting business, and maybe each institution can use Kaltura as a video source. And then we just put the cataloging and launch the video from your Kaltura. So there are many ideas where, if you're interested, I'm more than happy to talk to you if there's any small video project to talk about. But does it make sense for us to hold video? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Makes sense for us to hold the images. This image is not that big and we'll make sure it's there forever. Uh, but video is that maybe it should be local. Maybe not everything should be software as a service. So those are the questions we are confronting every day. We're more than happy to talk and decide what's better for you. That you Again, a community college may say, I store, store all my video, I don't want even a hard drive anywhere. But any other university may say, fine, I have the infrastructure, I build Katura, which is a very good video 
uh, open source video repository, and then we just link with you. We have all the cattle uh, metadata, and the user won't know where they put the image from us or video from you. So we're completely open. So if you have an interesting project, talk to me. Are there any other questions to many of our particular partners in the digital injection effort? So you talked a lot about professors uploading information and pictures. But what about students? What if there's an art student or an architecture student who, as they go through their learning process, uh, develop their own ideas and, and they're digitized? Is, is there a way or does okay, that match your initiatives? We, it's up to the school. It's very interesting. It's not, it's not a technology problem. It's a policy problem. A lot of the school doesn't want to turn this into a... A flicker for, hey, look at my, last night I was in a party, look at my image. So I don't think it will happen, I'm just trying to be funny. So it's up to the school to decide who, I mean, we can't control who upload. Professors assume they went to Greek for a sabbatical, come back with all kinds of cool images of different setio. Yes, but students, they can do homework. They can, I totally agree, so it's a policy. We allow, this up to the school to decide who can have access to those features. What if it was more of like a uh, go through your professor? So oh, the, yes, yes, the yes. professor sort of has a shared say. Is, is that appropriate for our students? I, I, I think that would definitely make sense. I think that would definitely make sense. A good idea because we do create course folder. You, a professor can create course folder inside our store that all the students can put in their homework by creating image group or uh, comment an image and talk about images. But yes, that's an interesting point. A professor could allow students to upload image only for that folder. The question would be how long we want to preserve that as a yeah. as See, a, I, I as think a, a university. And there are in our archives we do right, some of that, but, and how much of it is sort of temporal. Right, so it's a exactly. question of can put a time frame on. Student is pretty yeah. professor will teach forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Student with temporal. Right. But at the same time, it's perhaps that student goes on to be a great industry leader or whatever that that his work from from, stu from student on to professional would be stored there, and it would be yeah. a, a great e-portfolio, talk about the whole e-portfolio concept, right. you That's heard true. about yeah. that, so who should be the e-portfolio? That's a $2 question, exactly. <laughs> and actually, Astor has been around, so I talk to people, I was a student when I used Astor, it's terrible, now I'm a professor, I like it. I heard a <laughs> story like that too, yes. Yeah, very good point, how can we have, well, I'm sorry I keep mentioning scholar professor, student important too. Someone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But maybe a restricted student space, right? We don't want to make it like flicker and anybody upload any uh, party pictures. Yeah, very good point. Any comments or questions? There's a couple of expressions that look like they're mulling something. <laughs> Well, now let us thank you again, and then let me invite you all to hang around here, and those of you who need to set up, and I think within about half an hour or so, we'll be uh, as involved. Yes, our now I can learn. Our, now our I can learn all your stuff.